Okay, here we go. This is the second video that I'm uh, uploading where I discuss the Richard Dawkins, Brett Weinstein debate. In the last video, I laid out um, a key disagreement that I have with both of them having to do with the role of genes versus the role of organisms in um, the evolutionary process and how we explain life. I totally disagree with the, the gene-centric um, approach in biology because I think it negates or at least downplays the role of organisms in the evolutionary process uh, where individual organisms have a sort of um, creative anticipatory capacity that merely looking at um, genetic replicator mechanisms misses. Now in this video I want to talk a little bit about the extent to which human beings, human culture, human society can be understood evolutionarily, can be understood as um, continuous with the the process of um, animal evolution and plant evolution and um, single cell evolution that preceded us. Uh, if we have that lineage, that biological lineage, clearly there must be uh, something about our, our human behavior that is inherited from that lineage. And so in that sense, I agree, I think, well, with both Weinstein and, and Dawkins that, um, you know, human beings are evolved creatures. But where I disagree with each of them, and for different reasons, is that I don't think we can understand evolution purely through genetic replication, as I've already um, described. And I also don't think that what we call human consciousness is in any way separate from um, that process of biological evolution, such that it could turn back on the process, turn, turn, turn back on itself, and rebel. Uh, you know, so when Dawkins says that humans need to rebel against their selfish genes, and where um, Weinstein agrees with him but says, you know, we rebel against it by gaining conscious control over processes of mimetic evolution, which Weinstein thinks are selected genetically for their survival value. What I'm saying is that there's no separate consciousness that could turn back on mimetic evolution, just as there's no separate consciousness that could turn back on genetic evolution. Because somehow or another, we're going to need to explain consciousness so that it is not a miracle that emerged uh, at some point in the last few thousand years when humans what, like invented language or something. Clearly, written language is uh, an enhancement of a complexification of an augmentation of something um, that came before, and it's radically new, but not so radically new that it constitutes this sharp break in the evolutionary continuum. Consciousness has been, I would argue, present the whole time, throughout the entire evolutionary process, not in the same form, not in the same, with the same capacity. But when I talk about the creativity of individual organisms, what I'm talking about is the role of consciousness in um, providing their capacity to make decisions, to anticipate the future, to remember the past. The role of consciousness in evolution is completely ignored by gene-centric approaches to biology. And so, I'm interested in what Alfred North Whitehead would call an, a non-bifurcated understanding of nature, uh, where if we're going to understand how human beings are, in fact, evolved organisms, then we're going to need to understand how it is uh, that an evolutionary process led to conscious, reflective, free, at least potentially free, uh, beings like us. And Whitehead thinks that the way to do that, and I follow him here, is is not to um, 
figure out what sort of strange arrangement of neurons or um, some other mechanism could somehow produce consciousness suddenly from what was otherwise just a chemical, physical soup of law abiding interactions, but rather, well, what must physics and chemistry be such that something like consciousness or even just living organization would be possible? And it turns out that we can't anymore conceive of physics and chemistry as just mechanical processes, that there is um, a self-organizing dynamic at play in the pre-living world that makes life and consciousness possible. And, you know, various theorists like Terence Deacon and um, Evan Thompson, um, biosemioticians like Jasper Hoffmeyer, they're, they're trying to understand how um, physics and chemistry might in fact be semiotic processes, right? Processes of, 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 sh of, of sign exchange already. And so when we talk about, you know, the genome and the way that uh, DNA seems to stand for certain, you know, traits, there's a semiotic relationship here, which is to say that um, there is meaning in the world outside the context of just human culture and language. And the human culture and language are an expression of uh, processes of meaning making that preceded them evolutionarily. And so breaking down this dualism between consciousness, human consciousness, and the biological process that led to it is, is the name of the game uh, for me. And so, you know, when I try to enter into a discussion between Dawkins and Weinstein, I think that philosophical co commitment of mine, um, it can be a conversation stopper, maybe, because, you know, Dawkins and, and Weinstein might not even want to go there. But I'm interested in having that conversation if, if they are or if anyone else who has a stake in this debate wants to go there. So let me know what you think.